Uh, thank you, Sevki, for that really uh, generous introduction. Um, I was very excited that Sevki chose to introduce me because I've also um, been looking at Sevki's work and so I'm really interested in, in continuing our conversations uh, during my time here at uh, the Rachel Carson Center. And it's a real um, privilege, and, uh, privilege for me to be presenting to you um, here today and to be at the RCC uh, working on a book project which is proposing a way of thinking about uh, extending or opening gastronomy to, to non-human agency. Um, and I can't think of a more uh, collegial and supportive environment in which to be undertaking this task, so thank you. Um, so as an introduction today, I'll begin by first explaining what I mean by gastronomy, um, because it's not necessarily obvious, and what might be involved in extending the ontological boundaries beyond the human, and then drawing on a case study from my book uh, involving uh, goat's cheesemakers who take a deep interest in, um, in the rumen. So that's roughly what I'll, I'll be doing today. Um, although my presentation is dealing with goats, uh, cheesemakers and dairy goats, I won't actually be speaking about cheese. Instead, I'll be exploring what it might mean to take seriously a goat as a gastronomic subject. That is, to acknowledge their pleasurable interests in food, and therefore to consider what a ruminant gastronomy like, might, might look like within the creaturely web of relations that make cheese possible. So by ruminant gastronomy, I'm thinking about what it means to feed goats well and what modes of interspecies attentiveness are needed to do that. As such, I'm proposing uh, farming in this very situated context as a gastronomic practice, but a gastronomy that's not just for humans, but for non-humans as well, a multi-species gastronomy as I call it. Most of us would probably associate gastronomy with fine dining and chefs and the food of the elite, which of course um, is, is the case. Um, gastronomy as a discourse and a practice has long been dominated by the interests of the elite. But the fundamental question of gastronomy, how to live well by eating well, is actually a broad concern. And there are of course no standard criteria for how eating well fits into the good life. Eating well can be as simple as having your lunch in front of your, uh, with your colleagues instead of in front of the computer. It might mean preparing and serving a dish to your children that you learned from your ancestors. It could mean the pleasure of foraging or hunting and sharing food with family or friends. So that is to say, just because the interests of the elite have been overrepresented in gastronomic history and culture does not mean that the pleasures of eating well are their exclusive domain. Nor would I argue should they be the sole domain of humans. But I'll just start by explaining a little bit about what gastronomy does. Firstly, it functions as a normative discourse, prescribing how one should eat and one should not eat. And there are very few cultures that don't have some sort of prescriptions or norms about the good way to eat. And this normative dimension of gastronomy is evident in its etymological roots. The Greek gastro means stomach and nomos refers to rules or laws. So gastronomy has long prescribed what pleasures are to be had, in what manner, and at what intensities. Gastronomy also functions as an evaluative discourse that shapes the criteria by which food and eating might be judged and sorted into ontological categories. The first being, and most important being, is this edible? Uh, and then, is it good? Which itself is determined by a wide range of values, aesthetic, health, ethics, and so on. It also deals with epistemological concepts and practices such as connoisseurship and ideas of good taste through which knowledge is performed publicly and privately. And this is where elite food narratives circulate most strongly. In contrast to other fields that engage with related questions of good ways to eat and live, medicine, dietetics, religion and so on, gastronomy is attuned to the sensual, embodied and affective relations of eating. And that's fundamentally what makes gastronomy interesting to me. With its attentiveness to social and sensual pleasures in making sense of the world through food, gastronomy is a potentially fertile site of discourse, practice, and scholarly inquiry to address the fundamental question of how it might be possible to eat and live well together. However, gastronomy comes with its own conceptual limitations, which my project seeks to address to some extent. This limitation is most starkly illuminated in the aphorisms of 19th century French gastronomer Brilla Savarin with his book, The Physiology of Taste, which has in fact been in print since it was first published in 1825. Considered one of the most influential texts of Western gastronomy, Brilla Savarin contends that humans enjoy a divinely bestowed capacity for pleasure, pleasure which we are morally obligated to, to appreciate. But the, the rise of French gastronomy did more than simply legitimize pleasure amongst the growing bourgeoisie. 
Gas, uh, Brilla Savara and other gastronomes of the period aestheticized the act of reading about food in new ways and in the process reinforced a Western privileging of textual gastronomy. Those gastronomic practices not codified in writing, particularly of those people and places brought under imperial rule, were disparaged or dismissed. Because of his centrality in the history of gastronomy, I'll take a couple of his um, aphorisms as my springboard. And many of you would be familiar with the fourth. Tell me what you eat, I'll tell you what you are. Donna Haraway might describe this as Western gastronomy's ultimate god trick. And I'll spare you all four, uh, 19 other aphorisms. But the first aphorism is actually important, and I think it's one that we can probably all agree on. Uh, the world is nothing without life, and all that lives takes nourishment. But his second aphorism is corrective, seeking to establish a clear hierarchy of species. Animal feeds, man eats, only the man of intellect knows how to eat. As such, he maintains that man is the only gourmand of nature. And in this exclusionary gesture, knowing how to eat is taken as evidence of human, humanity's exceptionalism over other species, and indeed of some humans over others. Though Brilla Savarin somewhat radically turns to his God to justify pleasure, Haraway reminds us that in this same Christian tradition, everything is food for man. Man is food only for himself and his God. In this feast, there are no companion species, no cross-category messmates at table. So it's not surprising that Western gastronomy has largely neglected the plants, animal, fungi, bacteria, minerals, uh, and water with whom we eat and upon which good food depends. At the same time, the ways in which the Western world has sought to feed itself have led to devastating ecological transformation and suffering of humans and non-humans alike. As we enter the world's sixth mass, mass extinction, we urgently, re urgently require a rethinking of relations between species and a broadening of gastronomic sociality. A core part of my project is therefore to counter this master narrative of Western gastronomy's humanism and to consider how it might be opened up to thinking with the lively multi-species entanglements upon which practices of eating well depend so that we might eat better, not just amongst humans, but with other messmates at the table. So along these lines, my presentation today reflect, reflects this broader interest in telling new stories of food making that explore the social and metabolic entanglements of gastronomic coexistence. Anna Singh's Testimony of a Spore offers a wonderful example of a critical counter to gastronomy's human exceptionalism, even if she doesn't frame it as gastronomic, I think that it is. Her playful narrative featuring a Matsutake spore as its protagonist reflects on the possibilities of fungal pleasure, the joy of flight, seeking out new tastes amongst rocks, and enjoying the symbiotic meals made possible by the fat noodles and sweet juice of tree roots, as she puts it. This fungal gastronomy suggests an alternative ontology of eating well, one that shatters the, ma the fantasy of the rational, bounded, and self-made subject of Western metaphysics, the man of intellect for whom knowing how to eat serves as a marker of his superior superiority in every sense of the word. So today I want to propose the possibility of a ruminant gastronomy through a story of two, two cheesemakers, Carla and Anne-Marie, who live on 204 acres just on, with just under 100 milking goats, plus the pregnant goats and their kids. My focus today is on the broader attentiveness that threads through Carla and Anne-Marie's farming practice, from how they learn to become farmers to the way in which they manage the dietary needs of the herd. I want to illustrate how gastronomy can be considered a practice of worlding that, as Stacey Alemo suggests, quote, constructs habitats that can support a diverse range of symbiotic relations and interwoven pleasures. I propose that these worlding practices might help us to imagine a ruminant gastronomy constituted by a web of creaturely relations that reveals multi-species gastronomy's transcorporeal nature. Pasture passes through the rumen of goats, through the metabolic action of bacteria. Manure enriches the bacterial liveliness of the soil, which in turn nourishes the grass that live there. Yeast live, gather on cheese, but also colonize the bodies of cheesemakers. The flesh of male goats becomes food for humans. Milk from these male goats, sisters, mothers, and daughters, is transformed into cheese through yeast and bacteria and enjoyed by cheese lovers across the country. Carla and Anne-Marie have lived with their herd of goats since they purchased the property in 1999. And within their industry, they're considered uh, farmhouse cheesemakers, which means that they not only uh, make cheese at a small scale, but have their own herd and their own milk. 
Over the years, they've developed a range of fresh lactic acid uh, cheeses as well as mature cheeses. And beneath the rinds of these cheeses lives this much larger ecosystem that reflects the appetites and social worlds that produce them. The animals, their milk and their rumen, the pasture, the soil, the cheesemaker, her cheese room, along with all the microbial uh, agents that weave a story of gastronomic co-production. So when I arrive at Carla and Anne Marie's farm, I learn that goats know exactly what to do when they spot a human visitor with a brush in her hand. Standing in the middle of the herd as they wait to be milked, their warm, bristled bodies jostle and push against mine. A goat marked with blue to indicate that she's a young mother who should be milked first is quick to nudge in. I try to be egalitarian with my brushing, particularly with so many vying for my attention. But I notice that Bluey, however, is pushing the goats out of the way in, in order to return to center stage and uh, get seconds and thirds. She doesn't know this, but the mark on her back is giving her game away. So I shoo her off and move, her on to, move on to another goat who's waiting her turn. This researcher come goat groomer enjoys the embodied sensation of being pushed around by these insistent, pleasure-seeking, and charismatic creatures. Under the gaze of their strange, caprine eyes, serving their desire to be groomed allows me to circulate within their orbit of attentiveness. The pleasure of group goat grooming are oddly reciprocal, but from my human end of the encounter, it feels good to be subject to their regard. In different ways and for different reasons, we are attentive to each other in this convivial moment of giving and taking. These shared pleasures of interspecies closeness enable us to hold each other in regard through a mutual attentiveness cultivated by the practice of grooming and the affect co-produced by the jostling of bodies against one another. Part of Carla and Anne Marie's apprenticeship into cheesemaking first involved learning the way of being a farmer, as Carla puts it. Being a farmer is far from straightforward, for there are many ways of inhabiting a farmer identity. It's not simply a matter of collecting a set of skills like mending fences and moving animals across a paddock and cutting curd. What Carla means is a particular way of knowing, and more specifically, a mode of attentiveness that, is, that sits at the center of her work. When she speaks about her most formative experiences in learning the way of being a farmer, it was time spent with Mary, an elderly Irish woman who was the couple's mentor in cheesemaking. Mary encouraged an embodied presence by, quote, allowing yourself to be unintentional in the landscape, as Carla explains, so that you'd heard the sound change or you'd notice when the air starts to be still. You'd notice. It's good, isn't it? The aesthetics of cheese, its goodness, if you like, begins with this cultivation of attentiveness. This less bounded form of knowing or noticing necessitates putting aside one's own human intention momentarily and attending to what others notice. What, do you, what did you see when you weren't looking, Mary would ask after a day's work. She invites Carla and Anne-Marie to notice how, quote, animals choose this spot and not that spot, or find a very still special spot where they want to be. Noticing what others notice is contingent on acknowledging the knowledge of the other and learning in turn what this might offer for becoming a farmer, or more importantly, for creating productive habitats that are responsive to the needs, pleasures, and appetites of other creatures. It composes a kind of transcorporeal knowing, which in the act of not looking, discerns affective and material qualities of life and living that might be imperceptible to the focused mind sharpened by its rationalist and instrumentalist thrust. For Carla, learning to notice without a predetermined outcome, what Singh might call an art of noticing, is central to caring for the, the myriad species on the farm. As she explains, when I'm looking at the paddock, I'm not thinking of it in direct relationship to the milk, or in the, the milk quality and the cheese. I'm thinking of it in direct relationship to trying to really get better and better at seeing and understanding what most enhances the soil system and the plant systems. But this noticing does something else. In the process of opening herself to earthly others, new subjectivities come to the fore in unexpected ways. Carla reaches for the words to capture the affective force of these intersubjective moments. For me, no, the noticing is the strangeness of how slow you are to notice, to actually see a tree. For me, I think it's maybe one or two trees a year that you'll go, oh, look at you. How amazing. Like you just seen a friend or you'd seen something beautiful where you think, gee, I'd like to know you better. It's like that. And this is one of those trees. Being drawn into this emergent in intersubjectivity carries aesthetic and ethical significance, both in terms of how she learns to be affected by pasture and trees, but also how she cares for the goats that enjoy them. Their interest in goats, I suspect, comes from the sense of mutuality I experienced while brushing them in the dairy. 
It's not just that goats are interesting, but that they're interested and engaged. They're not aloof, Carla says. And then she corrects herself to make some allowance for individual differences. There are some scary goats. They're scared. Some start like that, and then a few years later, they're settled down. Occasionally, one of them wants to stay crazy. I'm not a people person, okay? In my fieldwork, a certain anthropomorphism often operates as shorthand for farmers who work closely with other species, whether it be goats in this case, or pigs, or yeast in some cases, or in other cases, farmers who identify as being sheepy. And whilst decried as a critical flaw, flaw in thinking by some, anthropomorpho anthropomorphism is also being conceptualized as critical, empathetic, strategic, and, and aesthetic by others. It allows Carla, for example, to respond to a goat who is not a people person by giving her the, the goat, the space, that both, uh, both need to feel comfortable in each other's company. Individual differences notwithstanding, Carla not only enjoys the unique species characteristics of goats, but feels transformed by their, char their charismatic agency. They're lovely, anim lo lovely, kind animals, really. They make us kinder. This suggests a, an affective intersubjectivity that invites humans to reach across the gulf of species difference and be willing to be transformed in some way by the relation. Learning the way of being a farmer is therefore not only a matter of how to be attentive to the landscape, but becoming enrolled in the interests of others, in making oneself responsible to what others need and to the pleasures they might have the capacity to enjoy. So having provided a few examples of the interspecies webs of relation on the farm, how can we start to think about a, a, a ruminant gastronomy? This might seem like somewhat of an ironic task, given that goats have a reputation for eating, or at least trying to eat, just about anything, from clothing and purses to plastic bags. So they're not known as fussy eaters, but their mobile upper lip actually allows them to be quite selective as they forage and browse from the different environments in which they can live. And the fact that they eat from such a broad range of foods and even non-food is due to their inherent curiosity and adventurousness in their food practices. Recent research into French herding practices suggests that feeding goats well is as much an art as a science. Ruminants are highly motivated by the hedonics of their food and not only enjoy dietary variety, but come to expect it. Shepherds in France have revealed to animal ecologist Michel Muret and Fred Provenza how their animals feel strongly enough about what's on offer to them that they will become frustrated or bored, or in some cases sulk, or come to dislike the herder when faced with a diet that lacks interest or diversity. Other research on French shepherds frames the work of herds, herders in culinary terms. Farmers are described as chefs who design menus and set the table for their animal diners. And while there is, again, a strong anthropomorphic thrust here, it serves to acknowledge that feeding animals or feeding ruminants well is not simply a matter of ensuring adequate nutrition. It means attending to the aesthetic capabilities of other creatures. In framing ruminants as diners and farm farmers as chefs, grazing practices are understood beyond a succession of feeding events and acknowledge that when presented with a broad range of food options, ruminants are in fact quite discerning. Carla and Anne-Marie are not engaged in the same transhumance uh, herding practices that I've just described. Their goats are confined to a farm uh, rather than grazing wildly across uh, rangelands, which means that there's some constraints on their dietary habits and their rumen function. But they're nonetheless attuned, Carla and Anne-Marie, to how goats might take an aesthetic interest in their food. As Carla explains, they really like bark, but love a new paddock. They go and they eat all their favorite things first, just like you and I would. They love going into the paddock, having a look around, eating some bark, branches that have fallen off trees. I think they'll eat a branch in front of anything else. They're real browsers. As Carla describes what food they're offered at night, the pleasure slips from theirs to hers. We cut branches for them every night and give it to them in the sheds, and they go crazy. They just, they just go crazy for them. They love them. I love it. I love it. Love it. Everything about it. And it's good for them. This quote suggests how some food pleasures are shared across species, even if they're experienced in radically different ways. For goats, these are gustatory and embodied, perhaps from the satisfying texture of chewing wood and then later their cud. For hum uh, humans can't really understand uh, what kind of pleasure goats get from eating branches, but their enthusiasm for them is nonetheless self-evident for a farmer who knows her animals well. Carla's pleasures, on the other hand, are less material emerging from an interspecies relation of conviviality, the, far, the pleasure of giving pleasure to goats. But as Carla and Anne-Marie have learned, what goats ingest is only part of what's needed to feed them well. Goats cannot eat well without rumination. 
The room in one of four chambers in the goat's stomach is much more than a receptacle for digesting food. Inhabited by bacteria, protozoa, and fungi um, that ferment the ingested food, the rumen is an active agent in shaping what and how a goat can eat, passing food back up through the esophagus and into the mouth where it is rechewed and experienced anew. Chewing the cud is a critical process in extracting nutrients from the branches, leaves, and other fibrous matter that goats graze on. And comprised of a diverse microbial community, the rumen is, as Mira Hurd suggests, entangled in superb collegial symbiotic relationships, which help the, make the world more digestible to goats. That is to say, some of goats' favorite foods, branches, certain grains, and even bark, would not be digestible without rumen flora and cud chewing to break them down. But rumin, rumination serves much more than a nutritive function. Operating within this complex web of social and metabolic relationships, it enables a slow process of restoration, allowing the goats to conserve energy while still nourishing their bodies. But it's also a commensal practice that generates a certain affective state. As the herd collectively chews the cud, the goats enter into a relaxed, sleepy state together, the, room, the collective digestion reinforcing social relations within the herd. Eating well means having time to ruminate together. Chewing one's cud means refashioning what has been ta taken in so that the world the goat has consumed might be more fully and satisfactorily incorporated. All farmhouse cheesemakers know that good cheese depends on a healthy herd, but the importance of the rumen in good animal husbandry is not always accounted for. Usually the emphasis is on good nutrition and inputs rather than good rumination and digestion. In 2016, Carla and Anne-Marie encountered Opsalum, a system for managing rumen health introduced to them by veterinary scientist Bruno Gibadeau. Opsalum is short for Observation des Symptômes Alimentaires, so observation of elementary sy sy symptoms. And as two women who always felt that good observation was central to their farming practice, this system felt like a natural progression, although one quite different to the unintentional mode of noticing advocated by their mentor, Mary. Opsalim is situated within a broader network of alternative veterinary science that emerged in the 1990s in France. Where conventional veterinary practices focus on medical intervention and emergencies, alternative veterinarians adopt uh, first plant-based medicine um, over synthetic chemistry in the treatment of sick animals. Um, with many veterinarians augmenting their therapeutic practices by training in medical colleges and homeopathy centers for humans rather than animals. Opposed to poor animal welfare standards in industrial agriculture, alternative veterinary practitioners such as Gibido and others emphasize developing farmers' knowledge so they can be more autonomous in the care of their animals and less uh, dependent on industrial inputs. So Obsalom offers a means of interpreting, as Gibido uh, describes it, the language of the rumen, sign by sign, word by word, that allows the farmer to listen to what the animals are saying and hear how the herd speaks together even if it is, as he says, only whispering rather than shouting at you. Though they've always been deeply committed to the well-being of their goats, Carla and Anne-Marie had underestimated the importance of rumen flora and time needed for rumination until obsalum, or rather they needed another mode of attentiveness to hear what the rumen might have to say. Obsalum is a practice for not only thinking about the rumen, but thinking with the rumen. It's taken as a microcosm of interactions between agents within a broader world surrounding the goat. The diversity of pasture, the nutrition, nutritional rations of the ratio of the rations, the time and timing allowed for rumination, the quality of hay in the lounging sheds, the tannins in tree branches, the age and lineage of goats, variations in how humans care for goats, and other factors that are brought to bear on the rumen flora. As a practice for observing animals, Obsalom asks farmers to attend very specifically to the conditions under which a complex range of microorganisms might flourish symbiotically, and what this means for the goats who host them in her rumen. Uh, Obsalom involves using these diagnostic uh, cards and also um, poo cakes, as <laughs> Carla and Anne-Marie call them. So 10 color-coded uh, card series, 60 in total, point to a different set of symptoms. Um, for example, the red cards relate to hair, uh, the dark green to rumination, which is not up there, orange to skin. And the cards help to read the animal's body across its horizontal and vertical axis. Um, so if the upper hawk is dirty, then that means problems with the housing and where the goats are living. And if it's the lower hawks, it means it's an issue with their diet. An overly rich meal is often expressed in soft droppings. 
uh, which might take days to manifest. But an animal licking its area, the area behind its shoulder, doing that, because if you look back here, the rumen is in fact just sort of um, up, up here on the animal. So licking the shoulder is a symptom of an upset stomach. It's like a human kind of rubbing their belly. Um, and this is often caused by too much sugar in sweetgrass, which lowers the pH of the rumen and increases the acidity of the gut. And this acidosis or rumen instability is no trifling matter for a goat. An overly acidic rumen can kill off the beneficial flora and therefore inhibit fermentation, which itself can kill a goat if it's allowed to progress. A critical marker of a stable rumen is in the manure, hence the, the poo cakes, uh, which are prepared and discussed by staff at their Monday morning uh, meetings. And each week, a sample of droppings are gathered from a defined area of the uh, holding yards, rinsed with water until it runs clear, and pressed through a potato ricer to create this cake, which is then turned over onto a paper towel for inspection. Um, and undigested grains and short fibers mean that there's um, an incomplete digestion, and therefore a problem with the way in which the rumen is being enacted. And by enacted, I mean that the web of relations that constitutes a human rumen cannot simply be left alone. These nourishing microbial relations are co-produced through the practices of goats and humans alike, and therefore, as John Law suggests, must be done again and again if it's to hold. So while Carla enjoys indulging goats in their favorite food, Obsalom has taught her that it is irresponsible to take a hands-off approach to the goat's diet. The most important thing for goats, she says, is for them not to guts themselves. If the grass, grass is lush and green and there's too much of it, they'll just keep eating it and make themselves sick. Like you, having Christmas dinner, and for some reason, even though you're full, you're still eating the pavlova. Feeding goats well is both a matter of acknowledging the goat's capacity to take pleasure in their food, but ensuring that these pleasures do not undermine the del delicate balance of acidity within the rumen. Organizing their workday around the rumen can mean that it is harder for humans, as they, um, as they say, it stretches the day. However, as one of their French interns and veterinary students writing about Obsalom noted, we need to adapt to the goats and respect the cycle of the animals. But you're not just working with the goat. You're also working with millions of microorganisms in the gut. It's the symbiosis of the goat and the rumen flora. Obsalom gave us each a pair of glasses and helped us how to read the body of the goat. So reading the rumen or the body of a goat as a text, one that arguably speaks directly to the rules of, a stom of the stomach for the goat, challenges the human, humanist privileging of text in gastronomy, or rather it brings an alternative form of text and therefore potentially new voices into the purview of gastronomic production. Obsalom, in a, sense, in a sense, maintains the evaluative function of gastronomy. In taking the rumen as a signifying agent, it creates the conditions where goats can testify to the forms of coexistence that made, are made available to them and provide a means for understanding how goats bring their own judgment to bear on the quality of their nourishment. Obsalom, as a, ruminant, a practice of ruminant gastronomy, is also normative, dictating the rhythms that govern how the good life for a goat is best achieved without making universal claims about what this might involve. It by no means produces fixed answers or certainty, but demands a process of constant negotiation with the goat, the rumen, and its microbial agents. The rumen signifiers, loose droppings, runny eyes, short fibers in the poo cake, highlight symptoms of a problem but do not in themselves generate stable or definitive answers about how to respond. Responsibility to the rumen means understanding the very situated nature of each herd and the humans around it and being attuned to the specificities that allow some microorganisms to flourish and avoiding the conditions where a narrow range of other microorganisms become dominant or lethal. The discussion and the symptoms and the results of the poo cake tests means that Obsalom operates as an explicit knowledge practice on the farm around matters of shared con concern across all staff and interns. Responses to symptoms are negotiated by learning to be affected by the rumen, of making sense of the rules of the stomach, and understanding how, that, how these can be discursive, aesthetic, affective, and deeply embodied. So this very situated story of rumen and gastronomy helps, I hope, to imagine how the contours of gastronomy might be extended to other Turan critters, as Haraway puts it, through an attentiveness to what others might need to eat well and how their pleasures might be better accounted for in the production of food. The stories that human ta humans tell about the complex entanglements of life that sustain our species greatly inform the affective dimensions of production and consumption. 
shaping whether they're controlling, brutal and efficient, or nourishing, co-productive and expansively gastronomic. Composing these counter-narratives to humanist discourses of gastronomy is critical, I think, to redrawing the normative boundaries of what constitutes good ways of eating and living socially, metabolically and politically. I also believe they have the potential to cultivate more creative and responsible relationships with the edible species upon which we depend and from which new understandings of deliciousness might emerge. Thank you.